Tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdell, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's December 2023, and you are listening to episode 371, which is a conversation about the Japanese foreign film Godzilla Minus One, which is in theaters now. On this episode, I'm joined by Cole Burgett, who is a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary and the Moody Bible Institute. He teaches classes in Bible exposition and systematic theology, and also writes extensively about theology and popular culture. Cole has written an online cultural apologetics film review article about Godzilla Minus One, which is currently in theaters now, and his article is called Grief, Guilt, and Godzilla, a review of Godzilla Minus One. And you can read it for free at our website, equip.org. Cole, it's good to have you on again. It's always good to be here. Thanks. Well, this film is actually a foreign film that's in theaters now, and it is kind of culminating a 70th anniversary of the whole idea of Godzilla films. So... It's been a long time. I mean, it's it's older than both of us. So could you please give us an overview of just the whole, you know, idea of Godzilla films in the first place and its roots? Sure. So uh, the Godzilla series um, is a series of monster films, primarily uh, Japanese monster films uh, that sort of help to birth and give rise to this genre of film called kaiju uh if you've ever seen pacific rim uh that's sort of a a modern love letter to the kinds of films that uh godzilla helped to to inspire and that sort of thing um but godzilla is a particular character a particular kaiju or, or monster um within that genre of films, and it's arguably the most popular and well-known uh, today. So there's this, uh, I mean, it's, it's, everyone probably knows the idea of Godzilla at this point. It's, it's this, you know, prehistoric sort of uh, reptilian lizard monster that stomps around and, and uh, generally breathes fire or something like that. Um, so it's sort of a, a riff on the mythological dragon is the idea. Um, but the franchise uh, first came out in 1954 with the original film, and it's been a, a major hit since. If I'm not mistaken, I, I think it's the, the Guinness Book of World Records uh, recognizes the series as the longest continuously running film franchise. So, uh, there are some franchises that are, are older. Uh, we've talked about the Universal Monsters here on this podcast, and, and those movies, some of those movies came out sort of before Godzilla. Uh, but that particular uh, sub brand of Universal Pictures uh, doesn't have um, the status of being continuously in ongoing production. Um, Godzilla has, and that's actually sort of remarkable if you think about it for just a second. To be in continuous production, ongoing production since 1954, um, under the distribution of, of this company called Toho in Japan, and uh, it, it's it's really just from a cinematic perspective, you know, Godzilla, and really only I think James Bond, um, those two series have this sort of prestige position. Um, in in uh, the, the world of, of movies, uh, just because they've they've been around for so long and so many films have been made, the uh, the fil- the series I guess the, the franchise as a total uh, as a whole um, consists of thirty eight films, 
uh, 33 Japanese films, and then five American adaptations, two proper um, American adaptations, and then one of them has sort of spawned off its own little series. But uh, 38 films total is, is really an, an achievement. And the, the basic premise, and even though it sort of changes uh, from from era, you know, depending on how, uh, how how deep you want to get into this, there's basically uh, four eras. The, the way you sort of divide the franchise is by by four um, eras or, or periods of, of of the films. The Showa era, which originated the character um, and sort of moved the the development of the the idea of Godzilla along. Uh, the Heisei era. Uh, the third era was known as the Millennium Era. It's sort of a, a subcategory of the Heisei Era, and uh, the currently the, the the Riwa Era. They're all sort of named after the Japanese emperor during those periods of of production. Uh, but there's generally at this point four accepted to be four uh, eras or periods of the Godzilla films across which the they have been made. So that's the the central overview of of the franchise i the 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 conceit sort of remains the same across all the iterations although there are specific differences but the the general idea the sort of mythology the common mythology if you will for the character is that uh somewhere in the 1950s uh usually pinpointed to, to to 54 or something like that um during the uh, nuclear bomb tests on Bikini Atoll, uh, these nuclear tests sort of mutate some type of creature, underwater creature, uh, sort of charging it with nuclear energy. Uh, and it, it, it brings about Godzilla. So it's always sort of been representative or metaphorical in, in that regard. So that's the uh, brief overview of, of the, the series. It's interesting. You mentioned Pacific Rim, and that is one that I actually did see years ago. And that seems more, you know, in kind of like a superhero or fantasy type of setting. But this one is, particular film is grounded in real life events that you just mentioned. So how is you know, this film different than some of the other iterations of it, especially, you know, I think some of our listeners may not be as familiar with this series. And currently there's a series on Apple TV that's streaming. And there's also going to be another one of those Godzilla King Kong type films that's coming out next year. So are all of these different series and films connected in any way? Because this had more of like I said, a historical grounding, not seeming like, oh, I'm watching just another Marvel type of film or that kind of genre. Yeah, they're connected in the sense that they they have the same character um, at, at their core. But the, the the series that you're mentioning, this one on, the, on Apple TV and the Godzilla Kong film, those are um, American adaptations. So uh, back in 2014, a filmmaker named Gareth Edwards, uh, who would go on to do uh, Rogue One, uh, but who had started out making smaller scale films, one of them was called Monsters. Um, he, He brought Godzilla to American audiences for the the second adaptation, uh, largely better than the first. Uh, and it, it sparked off um, what is now sort of dubbed the MonsterVerse or uh, Legendaries uh, MonsterVerse. So that that is sort of its own thing now. Uh, the the Legendary films now it, it's it's brought in characters uh, from the Japanese films. It's 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 brought in characters like Rodan and Mothra and Ghidorah and all of those characters, but. Um, by and large, it, it is its own entity, uh, and th- those are probably the the ones that most of American audiences are are familiar with. Uh, those that this current era of of Godzilla Kong films, 
But the idea of doing a Godzilla Kong crossover, that actually started um, back, back in 62 with the third film of the original Japanese series. Um, King Kong, an American film, actually precedes Godzilla uh, by, by a little bit. Um, very popular um, old film uh, that everybody's probably familiar with. And in 1962, there was a, there was a crossover between um, uh, Universal and, and Toho and what they were doing. And uh, they, they actually did a, a King Kong Godzilla film where the two characters sort of meet and fight and that sort of a thing. Uh, so this, this new era of Godzilla Kong crossovers actually started, <laughs> interestingly enough, back in the, the early 60s. Uh, with with Toho, and now it's sort of getting the American treatment, and it's, it's actually proven to be pretty successful and popular. But no, the um, the Japanese films as a whole are are generally pretty different. And more recently, in, in the Riwa era, uh, the uh, the films that have sort of been released in, during this period, all of the films are really quite different from each other. They're very self contained. Uh, some of the films have shared continuity in previous eras of the Japanese films, uh, but largely um, these films that are being released now by Toho uh, are sort of very bespoke, uh, tailor-made, handcrafted, however you want to think of it. Um, but every film is sort of its its own entity. So no, this film in particular, uh, and really a lot of what the Japanese films are doing is not really connected in any way to the American adaptation, save for the fact that um, one feeds off the other's popularity and success, if that makes sense. You can also, you can sort of see this yin and yang effect if you look at it from a broad perspective, that anytime the franchise is sort of dormant on the Japanese side, uh, the American film is made, which has, you know, the, the big budget Hollywood effects behind it. And it sort of uh, revives interest and the Japanese uh, company Toho will come along and, and release uh, another film. So th there's a, there's a nice back and forth uh, with, with the, the, the American adaptations and the Japanese originals. And uh, it's, it's really sort of interesting that they, it's not really in competition with one another. It seems like a, a success for Godzilla on the American front is a success for Godzilla on the in, on the international front, and so they they sort of feed off each other in that way. But uh, no, no connection. Please consider partnering with us in the month of December, as you consider various year-end partnership donations to organizations that you support, and we would appreciate your support of the Christian Research Journal. We have moved from a paid subscription print magazine to an online magazine that's completely free without a paywall. And every week we bring you new written articles that are on our website, equip.org, as well as in-depth interviews with the authors of those articles. And if you go to our website, equip.org, and you scroll down, you'll see a section called Gifts for Your Donation, and you will find two that are featured for the Christian Research Journal. One is to get our very special collector's edition of the journal, the very last print issue that was published this summer, which is a special double issue. And it is a themed issue on the war on Western civilization. But also you can support us by giving us a gift and getting as our thank you to you various books from the Christian Research Journal authors that have been featured on this podcast. And the books that we're featuring right now are from longtime author Doug Groteis. He has written a new book, and you won't want to miss out on that, as well as we have two selections from Mama Bear Apologetics, and we have featured some podcasts with some of the women who are part of Mama Bear Apologetics, most recently our episode on the Barbie movie with Hilary Ferrer, and she founded Mama Bear Apologetics. So please go over to our website, equip.org, to check that out. Now, another way that you can help us out, really, 
which is just the gift of your time, is to give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts and help us out with the algorithm. Now, we would be super grateful if that was the way in which you thought of supporting us for the month of December because the last review that we've had, which is a written review about our podcast on Apple Podcasts, was published way back in the middle of August. So we would be really grateful if a few of you could go over there and write us a review because that helps us to be seen by other people looking for our content. So thank you for considering to partner with us with a donation or to take your time and give us a short review for Apple Podcasts. We are very grateful. So now back to my conversation with Cole Brigette and our discussion about the film Godzilla Minus One. Well, I talk about this and I ask it every time because I don't want someone to decide, oh, I'm out. I'm not going to listen to this. I don't really care about Godzilla at all. It's not something that I'm interested in. I don't think Christians should watch these kinds of movies. They don't have um, any, you know, reason for Christians to watch them. So I do want to always ask why Christians should care about this, because we continue to cover cultural apologetics, and that just doesn't always mean the traditional defense of the faith that we do in apologetics. I think it's really important because there's so many people watching these films, and also this has been really successful. It's made a lot of money at the box office for a foreign film where a lot of people don't like to sit through subtitles and it's doing very well in the theater. So it's it's really connected to people and they are watching Godzilla Minus One. So why should Christians care about the series as a whole, whether it be the Japanese films or any of these American adaptations? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And I would say that uh, we've sort of already hit on one of the first major reasons to take it seriously. And that's because it is one of the longest running film series ever. Again, if, 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 if you take any sort of uh, film class or foreign film class or something like that, Godzilla will come up. Um, when I, I would teach a, a unit of a class at Moody Bible Institute called Forbidden Knowledge and the Monstrous Novel, and I, I would teach um, the film unit for for that class for a couple of years. Uh, Godzilla is is one of the primary things that we would we would look at as a cultural artifact because of its widespread cultural appeal. It, it, it's sort of interesting. Godzilla is is so common to the lexicon now, uh, the popular lexicon. You you don't really have to explain the character himself. Everyone just sort of knows. Uh, it, it's it's part of the warp and woof of things now because it's been around for so long. Um, but for Christians specifically, uh, I can think of, uh, I guess, two reasons to, to sort of, um, th- that it's worth your time. Let me say it that way. The first of those being uh, that even though it, it's sort of goofy, right? We always, you can find a ton of memes of just goofy, you know, Godzilla moments from the 60s films and that sort of a thing. The original idea, uh, and there are a handful of, of films since then, um, actually take the, the concept, if not the character, very seriously. And here's what I mean by that. The, the first film uh, was laced with political themes. It had a very dark tone. It was It's a very serious film. I think people who have never seen the original 1954 Godzilla, and I don't mean the, the 55 or 56 one with Raymond Burr, the American re-release where they sort of edited Raymond Burr into the movie. But the original 1954 Godzilla film uh, are, are sort of surprised to see that, oh, this isn't tongue-in-cheek. This is a film that takes the events that are happening with all of the seriousness in the world. And the reason for that is because the character was a, a kind of metaphor. It was a film that dealt with the condition of post-war Japan that uh, is sort of rife with the, uh, the moody undertones and the uncertainty and the fear of, of nuclear disaster that those people were, were 
dealing with as a nation. Um, that makes it important. That makes it a very important film. It's, um, it's important for Japan and the complex internal mythology of the films is, is important for Japan in the same way that Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings is important for Britain. Um, it's it's just it's worth knowing and worth paying attention to, especially if you're interested in film uh, or anything like that. And secondly, uh, it, it's Japanese. It's it's a it's a cultural um, it, it crosses cultural boundaries with ease. And there are very few series that we have talked about on this podcast um, that I think we could say has a, a kind of universal appeal that actually did not originate with uh, American movies or American comic books or something like that. This is very Eastern. I'll put it that way. And uh, as a property to really get your hands on as a, especially if you're talking about cultural apologetics uh, as a, as a cultural artifact to really get your hands on that has a universal appeal, but isn't of necessarily American origin uh, that that's that makes it quite different, and it, it makes it uh, worthwhile. Uh, so it's certainly something that the uh, the Christian apologists can get their their hands on as a, as a cultural artifact and talk with other people about. Um, it, it, and I'll just be honest: is every film worth one's time? No, 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 no. I mean, the the, the series is sort of known for its campiness and goofiness, and and it does sort of devolve into that for the I would say the vast majority of its run. Not every one of these films is, is fantastic, but there are a handful that I think um, any Christian who's remotely interested in film should know of. The original 1954 one for sure, um, and honestly, I, I think the 2014 Godzilla film that Gareth Edwards did, is, the American one, is, is actually very good. That's a very good movie, um, and so is so is its sequel, King of the Monsters. So uh, there there are. There are reasons, I think, the, for the Christian to, to pay attention to this franchise. Well, what's really interesting about this particular film, and I want to talk about Godzilla Minus One specifically, is I just noted earlier that it's been successful. And, you know, despite the fact that it was made on a very minimal budget, well, this is by Hollywood standards, of course, of $15 million. And I just want to compare that to the recent Marvel film called The Marvels that was made for 270 million and that was released in November and basically has been a flop by most, you know, box office standards. It's only made 200 million dollars worldwide and needed to make more than 450 million to be considered successful. So it's it's at a loss I think for The Marvels. So what about this film that's received a lot of critical acclaim? And, you know, I think studios are probably wondering, wow, this film was made for $15 million and we just spent $270 million on the Marvels, which tanked. Um, what about it makes it unique or what about it is really catching not just critical attention, but also attention from film goers? You know, I saw various people on social media, friends of mine, people I know in real life who've loved the movie and have said that this is actually their movie of the year. They loved it so much. And I find that fascinating because again it's a foreign film so what is this film about and why do you think it's just kind of resonating with people and critics yeah it's really actually um kind of hard to overstate just how uh successful this film has been both in japanese and international markets so hollywood markets if you will american markets um made on a, on a budget of less than $15 million, which is, you know, practically a low budget film by modern American standards. I mean, we're looking at, we are so used to blockbusters that are made for $300 million, $250 million, $350 million. To have a film come along that's um, using special effects as much as, as Godzilla Minus One on a budget of less than $15 million, and to have universal, widespread critical acclaim, um, and to, to be making as, as much money as it is. Uh, you know, the, the Toho has, has a 
a bona fide hit. <laughs> this is this is this is really sort of a magnanimous achievement that I don't think anyone expected. Um, but it, I, I think it, it comes down to two things. One, I think this is sort of riding on the hills of the success of Godzilla versus Kong back in 2021. I, I think it, I think it was the American Godzilla series has actually rejuvenated interest in the character. Godzilla 2014 made money, and it was a pretty solid critical success, uh, and and it sort of re- regenerated uh, interest in the character in international markets. Godzilla King of the Monsters, which I saw, I thought was absolutely phenomenal, and if there's any Godzilla film of made that Christians can get really in, interested in, it's that one, because Godzilla is positioned as a Christ type, a literal Christ type, uh, which was all very intentional. Uh, Mike Doherty, the director, has, has talked about that at length. But um, those those American films have really brought the character back to the fore. So I think, at least here in America, there there's now a kind of interest in in uh, the character, and it's sort of undergoing a renaissance, if you will. So this film comes out. It's very different from the legendary MonsterVerse Godzilla. It's sort of standalone. You don't have to have known or seen. Um, previous films in order to to watch this one and get into it. But I think that the thing that has made it such a success um, with critics is, is the story Uh, and, and it's really economic use of, of the visual effects. Uh, Really it's, it's, it's incredibly well done. The story is, is going to follow, this is really sort of fascinating. The story is going to follow a, a kamikaze pilot who um, at the, the very beginning of the film uh, lands his, his plane on Odo Island sort of under the pretense that there are mechanical problems with it. And the mechanic on the island, um, th- this is in 1945, right? So this is World War II, the, very near the end of the war, which is sort of takes the character back to its roots, if you will. And uh, he lands his plane and, and the mechanic sort of figures out very quickly there's nothing wrong with this plane. This is a guy who's trying to not have to die. But that night, this sort of local legend, there's this legend on Odo Island about this this dinosaur-like creature that sort of lives in the water. This creature emerges and, and attacks the base that, that he's, he's landed at. And he, he sort of has a has a moment where he the, the main character has this moment where he's he's unable to uh, really do anything about it and and everybody on the island is sort of killed and the the mechanic's the only other guy alive who blames him for this so uh moving the story along when um operation crossroads launches a, a nuclear test at bikini atoll uh, this is the United States uh, nuclear test. Uh, it actually mutates this prehistoric creature into the traditional looking Godzilla. Uh, and it begins sort of rampaging uh, around Japan and the U.S. sort of wants no part of it. And uh, There's actually a, a scene using old footage of, of Douglas MacArthur in the film Um and, and they, he sends these sort of decommissioned uh, Japanese Navy vessels uh, to help. But, but the official U.S. policy is that, we're, you know, the tensions are high with the Soviets, so we're not going to do anything. So Japan is sort of left to fend for itself as this monster is coming at them. Uh, and the story really follows this, this uh, kamikaze pilot who starts out, you know, sort of just wanting to live. But in the aftermath, sees what his sees the destruction his country has endured, uh, and he he really struggles with survivor's guilt. He goes through the film sort of feeling as though uh, he should have died, that um, he's somehow wrong for wanting to live. He's somehow wrong for being alive, 
And so Godzilla, very interestingly in, in this this film, sort of becomes his... Uh, it, it becomes his... Uh, darkness. It becomes his nightmare. It becomes his doubt. The creature becomes everything that he uh, is sort of battling against psychologically. And so the, the, the character becomes almost a metaphor, if you will, for this guy's darkness. And it, it's, it's a fascinating way to marry um, the psychology of the main character to the literal events of the film that just gives the film a level of intelligence to it. It, When watching it, it's just a very smart film with good acting. Um, I I was talking with one of my filmmaker friends who saw saw the film just after I did. And he said, you know, I, I felt as though I could have watched the film with the subtitles off and followed it perfectly. He said the acting was that good. Um, and and he's, he was absolutely right. So it has great acting. It has a very smart story at its its core. It does something really interesting with uh, the Godzilla monster, um, and and I think it's it's just different enough. It's just intelligent enough. Uh, the script is good enough uh, that not only does the film have the new interest in the character going for it. Uh, but it just has some some good filmmakers involved, and that has contributed to its success both with the public and then with critics today. You just said that this film does something very interesting with the Godzilla monster, and in your written review, you talk about Godzilla working best when the monster is used as a metaphor or an allegory, And we kind of hinted to that just in the setting of this film being in World War II or post-World War II. Can you explain what you mean by that, that how this is very interesting, what they're doing with the monster, and maybe give us some examples about this? Yeah, so the writer-director for Godzilla Minus One, he he wrote the the script over a period of about three years. And he looked um, at the original Godzilla film, and Jaws, the uh, Spielberg film, uh, for for inspiration. Those were two movies he looked at for inspiration, uh, which, interestingly, were sort of two of the inspirations for the 2014 uh, Godzilla film as well. And he, he wrote the script over a period of, of three years. And this is a, a film that takes Godzilla back to his roots in a way that we really haven't seen in a lot of the sequels. And and I don't, you, you, you often hear people say that this is the film that takes Godzilla back to his, his roots. Um, but what tends to not happen is you to do a period piece. That tends to not be what you're seeing. This film, Godzilla Minus One, is actually a period piece. It it, it, it set, is set in the, uh, the late 40s, um, which is actually before, just before the, uh, the 54 release and uh it it takes the the idea that is there in the original 54 film um the let's say the ethos of the idea and uh does it differently here in that original 54 film um go, it, it was it was less let's create a monster movie. And it was more of let's create a metaphor for the um, social and political climate of Japan at the time. Uh, Godzilla, the character becomes a kind of metaphor or allegory. Um, All of the mythology that goes into the character's creation, you know, the nuclear tests uh, give rise to this, this creature that, that is sort of ravaging Japan. It's, it's a metaphor for nuclear fallout. It's a metaphor for the bombs being dropped. It's, it's, it's sort of tied up in this modern uh, era's advancing technology. Um, all of those themes, those very rich themes and storytelling are there in the original 1954. Uh, this is why watching the original and then watching some of the sequels a few years later 
like the King Kong Godzilla film, it, 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 they're, they're, it's sort of goofy to watch the others because you're like, well, you know, you're, you're, they're sure it's a versatile character and it's a versatile series, but there are a handful of films that actually has more on its mind. Um, the, uh, the film before this one, before Godzilla minus one was called Shin Godzilla. Uh, and it, it was very different as well, but it did this sort of the same thing. Uh, it updated the character to be less of a metaphor on uh, the war and World War II, but it became a kind of commentary on the Fukushima disaster. It, it sort of became this very cutting, biting commentary on the Japanese government um, and how the, uh, the Fukushima disaster was, was handled. Uh, and so the character has has always had this ability to be malleable in that way, to be used as a metaphor, as an allegory for social and political goings on in Japan at the time. Uh, Gareth Edwards in the 2014 film, when he brings Godzilla back, he does so in the context of the modern environmental crisis, but he does so in a way that that's really sort of quite tasteful. But the character of, of Godzilla seems to work best when he is given some kind of a metaphorical or allegorical role even to play. And again, it, it's a very malleable concept. The, the tone and the themes vary per film. Um, and, and everyone sort of to a degree, falls in love with the, the design of the character and, and that sort of thing. Um, but having the character function as a, uh, a kind of allegory, if you will, uh, really gets a lot of mileage out of film. It sort of elevates the material to something a little more um, literate, if you will. Uh, and in Godzilla Minus One, as, as we mentioned, uh, what's interesting is that the film is very personal. You know, the, the 1954 film is about the national mood of Japan. There are main characters, but, you know, the, it's, it's, almost, it's almost like an ensemble film. Um, the 2014 Godzilla uh, has human characters, but they're sort of less significant um, than, than what's going on with the, the monsters. This film, on the other hand, takes Godzilla and, and sort of literalizes the, the nightmare the main character is, is dealing with. Um, this, it, it, Godzilla becomes this metaphor for the survivor's guilt that he feels. Um, the uh, sort of his psychological trauma. Uh, the, the, he sort of is, is broken during his first encounter with, with Godzilla. Um, on Odo Island, and then the monster just sort of evolves and grows as the, the film goes on. Um, and he's sort of always confronting the character. At uh, He's always confronting Godzilla as, uh, as, as the beats in the story turn, as he sort of grows uh, in his realizations of, of the problems that he has psychologically, and as he looks for a reason to live. And it's a very interesting way to do Godzilla as a metaphor uh, that we really haven't seen before. Uh, so it, it goes back to its roots in that sense. It goes back to the original idea of the character as being representative of something and not just, you know, a, a big monster stomping around and breathing fire for the sake of having a monster stomping around and breathing fire. It actually has the character mean something. Um, that goes beyond just, you know, political and social commentary. It's, it actually becomes uh, a, something that means something very personal to the characters. Uh, and therefore, it, it lends the film a really interesting sort of uh, up-close and personal look. It, it's really a character piece, if you will, um, which we, we really haven't seen before from a film in, in this series. I think one of the things that made me think in particular and you know the context of this well first of all not everybody you know we're not 
live stream or not live stream, but we're not videoing these podcasts. So people might not know that I'm Asian, but in particular, I'm Japanese and World War II and the history of my family did affect us. But I want to say that it was very interesting about some of the commentary that he was making, maybe to speak into some Japanese um, cultural mores. And one of those things was there was this ongoing, well, at first you mentioned he had this survivor's guilt about surviving because he was supposed to be a kamikaze pilot and he was supposed to, you know, give himself up, you know, for as a sacrifice for, you know, national glory and the war and so forth. But when he gets back to Tokyo and it's devastated, and of course, you know, he's seen the death of all of these mechanics, except for one of them on this island where he had landed, he sees a letter that he remembers a letter or he finds it or something like that from his parents who said, come back, you know, we want to see you again, which was kind of interesting that they said to him that to him because he was going to be a kamikaze pilot. But there's an ongoing thread about having the will to live and to that uh, relationships are important. And I thought that was really interesting because that seemed to be making a statement that the filmmaker was doing about kind of the ethos of what happened when they had kamikaze pilots and even also just Japanese society in general. I mean, it is very much about the group and not the individual. Yeah, I think you bring a really interesting perspective to this, specifically the the material here. And this through line in the film about having the will to live, this film is shockingly pro-life. And I don't mean shockingly in the sense that uh, you wouldn't expect it. It's shocking in the sense that it's so blatant. This is a film, like I said, it's, 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 very, uh, it's a very personal, specific, character-driven film. But this is a film about a man who starts the movie wanting to live, decides that he should have died and probably deserves to die, and then has to find across a two-hour runtime a reason to live again. That, that's powerful. And that is something that you don't see today, a lot of. This, you know, particular Godzilla film takes the material, and it should. It takes the material, very much like the 54 film, with all the seriousness in the world. There is, I'm going to say, little to no humor in this movie, which stands in stark contrast to the loose or the tongue in cheek or the meta approach to storytelling that we have talked about on this podcast at different times. This is a serious film with real human drama at its, its core and very mature themes in the story. You know, there was a, one of the, the critics reviewing the film made the point that, look, we hear all the time today that people have what they call franchise fatigue. Well, they're sick of watching Marvel movies. They're sick of watching Star Wars films. And that's why these movies end up start losing money. Well, you know, looking at Godzilla, it's actually really difficult to argue <laughs> for a concept like franchise fatigue. Because here you have a franchise that has been around longer than most others that has a character that everyone knows in the pop culture lexicon, that has the number one streaming series on Apple TV Plus right now, that is coming out with a major American blockbuster next year, and now has this film in theaters. How, how, do, you, how do you explain that? Uh, and the point that the commentator was making was, it's not that people have franchise fatigue, it's the people have fatigue from bad movie making. Bad storytelling. Um, Because the story that this film tells is really good. Um, And it's really worthwhile. Uh, It's, it's in a lot of ways, very conservative. Um, Which is is sort of interesting. uh, That it it sort of... that's Part of what makes the, the, the film's success such a marvel and fascinating is it seems to fly in the face of all of what we might call modern conventional Hollywood standards, which is, you know, the bigger the budget, the more special effects, 
the more cameos, the more throwbacks, the more, you know, all of these things that sort of ride on nostalgia, basically what they've been doing for, with Star Wars for, for years now. The more that you do that, the more people show up. Well, if anything, that's proven to be not the case. Um, and here you have a film that is super original, um, even while it, it, it doesn't so much pay homage to what came before as it looks at the the intent behind like the 54 film and takes the seriousness of that and then um, translates that to something new without trying to reinvent the wheel. It just does something different. It tells a different kind of story. It tells a personal story that really works. Uh, and, and it's important. It, it, it's a story that Christians can absolutely get behind. It's a story that Christians, I think, would have a very interesting perspective on, more so than many others, especially in a, a cultural climate where things like, you know, depression and, you know, suicide rates are, are as astronomically high as they are. Uh, this is a film that's really worth paying attention to. Uh, and, and the fact that it's um, seeing such success in international markets is, is very promising. Well, another thing too, I think that would be of interest to Christians is I think this is the kind of film that maybe youth leaders could use where you could have some great discussions. There's nothing, no sexuality in it. There's not, I don't recall any even expletive at all in it. And kids from middle school to high school really enjoy kind of this type of film. And there's so much to discuss after whether you see it with your kids or whether a, a youth group or even just in the neighborhood, I think there's just a lot of ways in which we, you could engage a younger generation in particular with some of these themes that they might have not have thought of by just watching this film. Absolutely. And you know what's interesting about this? We, we talked earlier about um, a why should Christians care about the series. That recommendation, that's not the only film I've, I've actually would recommend this with the 2019 American sequel to Godzilla King of the Monsters. It was the, was the, the subtitle. Um, the one that I mentioned it, it, that literalizes Godzilla as a Christ type um, and has Christian iconography all over the thing. Again, all of that's very intentional. Um, I actually took several pastors to see the film after it came out um, for, for the same reasons you're mentioning here. Uh, I, there were, I had several friends. I was in seminary at the time. Um, who were, you know, pastors are getting ready to be pastors. And I, I said, you have to see this film. Um, it's it's really remarkable how closely this mirrors the Christ story. And, and I took them to, to see it. Th this seems to be a, a series that that's a thing with. And I, I'll be honest, um, there are not very many films. And, and I watch a lot of movies. There are very few films that I have ever seen that I would tell a pastor, you need to go see this as a pastor. You need to go see this film uh, to put your finger on the pulse of of where your your congregation is and a cultural artifact you can give them that's worthwhile. And with this series, in the past six seven years, I've done that twice: once with this film and one with one of the American ones. Um, that's remarkable. That's saying something. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm 100% with you on that. This is a very interesting film for Christians to to get their hands on and watch. It's interesting you said that this was a serious film. There wasn't any humor, little or no humor in it, which I think is in stark contrast kind of maybe to some of the American approaches. I, I was thinking of other monster type films like, say, Jurassic Park that also have these large dinosaur-like but a little bit more scary. I'm not saying that Godzilla isn't scary. It's a, it's a little bit more campy, you know, and that's the other thing too, in terms of with kids, is this going to be like, you couldn't have a sixth grader or something, see it. It's not that kind of film. I think it would be fine. Um, if anything, I think some of the more mature themes in terms of its setting, Oh, why was this all? Why is Tokyo in ruins? What happened? And actually, I think it's good on a number of levels because he put it in this historical setting. I think not only in its themes about having the will to live, why is it important that we have relationships? How can we have relationships beyond family, which we didn't talk about, but 
he goes back and his parents have died. Everyone's died. His neighbor kind of blames him for not being a kamikaze pilot and bringing shame on their community. And then he runs into a young woman and her child. But it turns out it's not her child. It's somebody's child who is an orphan. And so they kind of start this almost new family. There's no romantic interest at all at the very beginning with all of them. And there really isn't. You just see the hint of it at the very end. But they form this new kind of family and everyone assumes that they're a family. And so I just think that there's a lot to be to think through just historically that maybe kids, I don't know, World War II is so far removed from them. This is another way that you can get them to talk about a lot of different things. But um, I just want to say, so I would just say there's just a, a number of levels, not just the themes, but I think there's a lot to draw young kids in that if you have kids um, or youth group or neighborhood kids or whatever. I think that just thinking about 70 years of Godzilla, I think he, he's become almost this like mythic pop culture figure. He's kind of taken on a life of his own. And just like this one is really serious film, maybe, you know, way back, you were just talking about its origins back in 1954, with the very first one, it was a very serious film. Can you compare that film to the current one? I mean, has it come back to being a more serious, you know, consideration of these kinds of things? Maybe that hasn't been seen in some of the sequels, you know, since the very first film and now 70 years later, kind of, okay, we're going back to the foundation, the roots of this character. Yeah, there's uh, there's certainly connections um, throughout throughout the, the history of the, the franchise where you, you'll find them sort of you know again going back to their roots and, and trying trying to sort of recapture what it is that that makes the series or I guess I should say that made the series such a hit in the first place. Um, and and again, what I, what I think this film does so incredibly well is take the ethos of that 54 film without trying to, to replicate the shots. You see the the thing with so many remakes and this today, it's, it's one thing to, to go back and just sort of redo what's been done before and um, borrow something as superficial as a shot or trying to incorporate a similar theme. This is one of the few films, this this new film is one of the few films that really seems to understand what the 54 film was doing with its uh, social commentary, um, grounding the viewer in post-war Japan, uh, letting them see the anxiety that a nation was feeling uh, as it was trying to rebuild itself. And after, you know, it was for all intents and purposes, a, a kind of nuclear holocaust. And this film takes the, the approach, if you will, and runs it just in a different direction. In a, in a lot of ways, you could, you could argue that this is a remake of the original Godzilla film um, in a way that none of the others have been. Um because it really understands the approach the 54 film was, was taking. And I will say this is very different from um, the more popular Godzilla films right now, the legendary Godzilla films. Um, and it's not that I think the legendary Godzilla films are bad. On the contrary, I, I really like them. You know, I, I, I liked Godzilla Kong. I liked all those. I thought they were, you know, fun, fun movies. Um, that being said, what this film is doing and what those films are doing um, are very, very different. And those films, interestingly, the, the legendary series has sort of moved into the more campiness of the character, um, to use your word. They, they've sort of played into the, the goofiness of it, even though the 2014 Godzilla film was a very serious affair as, as well. Um, they, they've leaned into the, 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 the sort of fun, you know, big budget type of, of goofy stuff. Um, I, I think I, I told someone, I saw the trailer for the, the new one that's coming out next year. I said, I've never been so excited for something so stupid in my life <laughs> because the trailer just goofy. It's crazy. But um, 
Godzilla minus one, on the other hand, uh, sort of came out of nowhere uh, with with very uh, very good storytelling and very serious themes, and uh, I, I really think it's it's doing something good. So uh, it, it's it's the ethos it picks up on, and it really pays off. You just mentioned um, legendary, and some of our listeners might not be you know film nerds to know that legendary. Um, as a uh, film company has put out some of these various different Godzilla and King Kong movies. I mean, they did Kong Skull Island. We talked about Pacific Rim and they did Godzilla King of the Monster and Godzilla versus Kong more in the camp kind of column. And then also our listeners might not know, they released all of the Christopher Nolan Batman films. So they have done some, superhero kind of big budget type of films that have some serious themes to them. And the next year you mentioned, you saw the trailer, they're going to release Godzilla uh, versus Kong, the new empire. So do you think that these Godzilla films and the shared universe are worthwhile? I mean, cause they have put out some of the other ones p- because people might see this particular film and say, Oh, I really like this. So should I go back? Should I see Godzilla King of the monsters or Godzilla versus Kong? So you could watch the 2014 Godzilla, Gareth Edwards Godzilla film after this one, and you'll see some similarities. The sort of restraint with showing Godzilla is there. Um, the the other Godzilla film, the, the 2014 one, uh, I, I really liked and still do. I remember seeing that in, in an IMAX theater and being just completely blown away. Um, it was... It, it was really a well-made movie and it shows a lot of restraint, but it doesn't have the personal touch that this film has. It doesn't have the psychological elements that Godzilla minus one has. Um, and I would say the legendary movies are worth it in their own right. Um, but it's not the same level of intentional storytelling uh, that Godzilla minus one is. Of the legendary films, it does. If if you if you're into the shared universe thing and you you like uh, getting into to franchises and, and figuring it out, that's actually a really good series and a successful series to dig into. Um, from Godzilla to Kong Skull Island, all of those films sort of coalesce in in Godzilla versus Kong, and then the the sequel that's coming out. Um, but in particular. I I think King of the Monsters, Godzilla King of the Monsters, the sequel to the 2014 film, is um, it's an extremely good film, and it's a film that Christians uh, Christians can really get behind. Again, it positions Godzilla as a kind of Christ type, which was so fascinating to watch. Um, it really struck a uh, struck a chord as I was uh, watching it that I it's sort of an obvious thing. Why would you, why would you never portray, you know, Godzilla as the savior of humanity in a way? Um, It it becomes like an, it's a Christ type. That's like a Christ of the apocalypse, which you never see. You never see a a Christ of the apocalypse, Christ type. And that's what Godzilla is presented as in that film. And that's absolutely fascinating. Um, So yeah, I I think you could get uh, into the, the legendary series, um, if you if you haven't already, I, I would say that they are probably best watched in sequence. There is a very intentional sequence to those films, not in the same way that Marvel does all of the little tiny cameos and crossovers and things like that. But there is a sort of uh, thematic building, if you will, that occurs in um, the legendary monster verse is sort of what they call it now. Uh, but yeah, I think um, even if they're not necessarily uh, groundbreaking films, the themes that they're working with are themes that we've talked about on this podcast. If, uh, for example, Kong Skull Island, the second film in the series, and is a sort of a remake of, it's not really a remake, but it's a redo of King Kong. Um, that, that director, Jordan Vote Roberts, talks a ton about making his film about the loss of myth in the modern world. Um, the, I, the idea of mythology runs all throughout the legendary series. And so I think it's important 
for an entirely different way um, than I think Godzilla Minus One is important. Um, the Legendary series is doing its own thing, but it's an interesting thing that that series is doing. And I think they really are some of the best uh, big blockbusters going right now. In a lot of ways, it really is sort of my favorite American shared universe, if you will, that's going on right now. I've, I've seen the Marvel films, uh, not so much the more recent ones. I've seen the DC films again, not so much the more recent ones, but I will, I will be in the theater <laughs> for the, for the new Godzilla Kong film. Um, I just think it's interesting what they're doing. So is 70 years of Godzilla films, what would you say if someone said, okay, I saw this one and I liked it. I don't know if I can get into all of them, but what should somebody watch if they want to know more about the series? So the uh, uh, Criterion Collection has, um, I think, a, a collection now of the Showa era films. And I, if you, if you, it's probably on Blu-ray. It's probably very expensive. That would be a, a place to start watching through them. However, I would say there's a lot of movies, and I understand everybody doesn't have the time. Um, but I, I would say that the, the films to watch... If you're wanting to do a kind of crash course in Godzilla studies, <laughs> which is weird to even say, is uh, the original 1954 Godzilla film, the 1955 sequel Godzilla Raids Again, the 1956 American sort of redo of Godzilla called King of the Monsters, Again, they sort of try to seamlessly insert these scenes with Raymond Burr into the original film. And it's it's a fascinating experiment, but it's it's what brought the character to, to international audiences and made him popular outside of Japan was that film. So it's an important film in that way. Any of those early Showa era films from 54 to really 65 you know, that's where you're going to see the Godzilla versus Kong original do. You're going to see Mothra. Uh, you're going to see Ghidorah. These iconic characters from the series. That's where they all crop up. Those early, early Showa era films. The return of Godzilla in the, the 1984 film in the uh, Heisei era. That's quite an important one. The Millennium series is a series of I think it's six films that started in 1999 and ran through 2004. That's its own storyline. You could watch all six of those and, and follow it pretty straightforward. And then uh, in this this modern Riwa era that started in 2016, it's five films proper, two live action, Shin Godzilla, which we talked about, and Godzilla Minus One. Both of those are very good films to see. There were three... Um, feature-length anime films released on Netflix between 2017 and 2018. And I, I've watched them all. They're very different. They're very, very different. You really have to like um, anime to get into those particular films. But uh, that, that's probably, I guess, 10 or 12 of the films that you could you could watch and, and try out and, and see, see how much mileage you get out of it. Uh, the 1998 American Godzilla film, Notice that I haven't mentioned it at all <laughs> because it's it's bad. It's really bad, and I I despise it. That was an Emmerich film um, that was just it was a misfire on all levels, and it it nearly it, well it killed the franchise in America for you know almost twenty years. It was that bad. Uh, but then the the legendary films are all sort of very good in their own right. Um, so that, that's that's probably of of the. 38 films that are out, I guess that's probably 15, I would say. Those early Showa era films for the first six years, the first couple of the Millennium, or the, the Millennium series, the first couple of the Heisei, and then uh, the two of the Riwa, and then the legendary films, it's about 15. Get you through. Well, on a much lighter note than monster rampaging through cities, I have a fun rapid fire question for Cole, since he's our avid movie watcher and it is december of course is there a classic christmas film even including die hard that you like to watch every christmas time out of nostalgia uh yeah um this is, is I, I think it's sort of seen as a low-hanging fruit but it's it was always on in my house growing up and that was christmas vacation i watch it 
every year. <laughs> Every, I did not think you were going to say Christmas. I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. Or uh, a Christmas story with George C. Scott or a wonderful life. I know, I know that was unexpected, but that's, you know, my, uh, my, I have to blame my dad for that one because that film is on so much. And my, when my, my sister got married, my, my brother-in-law, I remember he made the comment one Christmas, he goes, Every time I come to this house, this movie is playing in the month of December. <laughs> it was just on all the time. So now it's, it's just, you know. It's a family tradition. It's a tradition. Well, that's an old school film. So if anyone wants to try that out and they're younger, they could give that a whirl this Christmas season. But thanks, Cole, for being a guest again on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. It's always good to be here. Thank you. You've been listening to episode 371 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Today's guest was Cole Burgett. He has written an online cultural apologetics film review for the Christian Research Journal. His article is called Grief, Guilt, and Godzilla, a review of Godzilla Minus One. And you can read it for free without a paywall at our website, equip.org. Stay connected with the Christian Research Institute and all the new content we have coming your way. The best way to do that is to head on over to our website, equip.org. There you will find thousands of free resources right at your fingertips, from articles to video to audio, and it's all for free. You'll find our podcasts hosted there as well as the Bible Answer Man broadcast, which is hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff and streams live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. In addition, you don't want to miss out on subscribing to Hank Unplugged, which is the podcast of Hank Hanegraaff. And in that podcast, he has really in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And in addition, he has a new series on his podcast feed called Hank Unplugged Shorts, which Hank goes into the headlines in the mainstream media and refutes a lot of those cultural issues that we have in these short podcast episodes. And there's quite a few of them. You don't want to miss out on them. Now, if you want to find some of this at other places where it's all in one place, really subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get all of our content there, our podcasts there, and different individual questions theologically that people have that Hank answers at our YouTube channel. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know how to subscribe to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube account. Well, actually, you might just have a YouTube account. If you have a Gmail address, you have a YouTube account. Just log into YouTube with your Gmail address and search for Bible Answer Man channel and please become one of our subscribers. In addition, if you see that bell icon right there on our front page, please click that. And every time that we have new content, you will receive a notification that new content is up on our channel for you to be able to consume. So thank you so much for the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. We are grateful for you listening and reading and watching. (music) 